It's, it's beyond the edge of what we know. Uh, well, it's, it's really, um, it starts from the premise that when we learn something, if we learn something, what is learning if it's not you know, pushing beyond the edge of what we know? Because as long as we do what we know, we are not learning. You learn something new, it's because you're going beyond what you know and you're going to something that is unknown. And my interest has always been to explore that edge. Um, so what I wanted to do was to start by basically uh, looking at what is it we mean by digital technology. And by digital technology, I'm really talking about um, anything today that has what, it's, you know, inside of it has a chip. The, I, I started from the basic premise that the IEEE, that engineering organization worldwide that sets the standards for computing, um, have decided that a computer or a computer chip or and that can that is contained in anything digital can only do three things it can store uh, transmit and receive information it can store information and it can process information the, the the interesting part for me was what happened when we use this kind of digital technology the first thing is um, when we use it to communicate we start connecting with people outside our immediate vicinity. Uh, for example, right now, I mean, let's face it, we're not even on the same continent. We're on opposite sides of the globe, practically. So uh, we can phone, we can email, we can text chat, we can video chat. But the idea is, as you mentioned with the canoe thing, is we can do this from anywhere to anywhere. What's important to realize is that we also become more accessible um, via social networks. Facebook, LinkedIn, um, and we can find experts from anywhere in the world and we can access them. We're no longer limited to just that, that paper kind of thing. Um, so we can communicate and connect in, in, in a very different manner, which means that we also redefine how we view and how we, how we conceive of what society is. And the fact that I can see you, you can see me, we can talk to each other, yet we're on opposite ends of the globe, we're no longer limited. We conceive society in a different manner. The, um, the second part is, is, is since we can, uh, the, the computer chip can store information um, immensely, if you want, um, um, the idea is, is we can start connecting with information, but what's different than what what it used to be when we would read articles, read journals, and whatnot, is we can connect now with information as it is being created, and we can participate in the creation of that information, of that new knowledge. So whether you're going from news feeds, scientific journals, and whatnot, the minute somebody writes something, you have access to it. So. The, 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 the first point is that kind of access is immediate. And the second thing is, is we eliminated the medium itself in the sense that you're no longer buying a paper journal or a paper book. You're, you're dealing with the information directly from any device, whether it be a smartphone, a tablet, computer, it doesn't matter. It's in your pocket, and you can access the information. Um, all of this is also stored in the cloud, which means that it's accessible from anywhere to anywhere at any time. Um, the, the result of this is we're reducing the time between uh, the moment an idea is created, if you want, and the moment that somebody can give you feedback on it. And we all know you write something, you put it out there, it gets published, a year later you get a comment on it, and what was I thinking at the time I wrote it? That distance is gone. So the way we conceive of information and feedback is now being completely reduced to almost nothing in terms of time. So this, is, this will alter completely the way we conceive of accessing information. Um, the, the third thing that the computer and the computer chip can do, whether it's in a phone or in, in, in a computer or whatever, is the fact that it can transform information. And since uh, Turing, back in the 40s and the 50s, when he created the first computer, the idea was that we could use this technology to actually automate processes um, that were, until then, just 
things that we thought we could only do with our mind. For example, um, at the beginning it was doing s uh, large calculations. This is something, a technology that is now no longer just replacing or augmenting physical things, but augmenting cognitive processes. So technology to automate processes that were until then the exclusive domain of the human intellect. Huge difference. Whether it's it's using you know simple calculators uh, on 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 your phone or or um, uh, editing photos, um, uh, we not only do we take pictures with these things, but we edit them with with these things. We can edit music. We can create music, create art. We can do statistics with these things. Um, all of these things is about using the technology to automatically transform information according to how we want to do it. So you don't need a dark room anymore as for the photographers. You can do it with any device you want. Um, you don't need a large computer to do statistics. You can do it on a tablet or even a phone if you want to. All of these things ha have in terms of impact that it's reducing the cognitive distance, the time between the, the, the moment that you say, what happens if I do this? and that you actually try it, do the calculation, and get the result. In, in statistics, what happens if I try this thing different, and I get immediate answer? Before that, if you did it all on paper, by the time you had, be, be, the time between having an idea and seeing the result, again, you forget what you were asking, so the, the, the progress of evolution of thought was much slower. We can use it to transform information on, on large scales, and, and that power, we're just starting to, the general public, and especially in education, we're just starting to understand the power of that. We use it in education for, uh, um, for communication, and we use it for information. We're just starting to use it um, for, for uh, that kind of process. And this kind of thinking, um, this is what let, has led me basically to... to, to uh, uh, to explore two large avenues, if you want. One was I wanted to see how we could capitalize on the potential of all these technologies um, for learning. And secondly, if we start using all these technologies for learning, what competencies do we need to do it? And what competencies are we likely to develop as we use it? Uh, uh, just to give you a very brief uh, back history, I, I started teaching online about um, almost 20, actually 20 years ago, 1995. Uh, that back there is, is, a, is a picture of me uh, in, in one of the first courses I gave. I still had black hair then, um, and, and I was teaching uh, with a large video conferencing system, and most of the stuff was then put online, um, and it was very difficult to see the audience and whatnot, so it was just a one-way kind of thing. There was not, not this kind of exchange. So what really came out of this was that I found that the students felt very disconnected, very isolated, and there was a huge dropout rate. Since then, um, we've obviously, to make a long story short, um, we've changed a lot. The systems we use are very different. Uh, I'm sure Roland talked about Adobe Connect and, and the kind of things that, that we use in the BA and that we use in the Masters. This is a screen capture of uh, the course I had last Thursday, not last night, but uh, last week. Um, and so we obviously we get to see all the students and so on and so forth. The the idea was that we were able to put together since 2009 this master's program where the students can be anywhere in the world, I can be anywhere in the world, any of the profs can be anywhere in the world, and we can get um, guest speakers and experts from anywhere in the world. As an example, in this screen capture behind me, um, which you probably can't see, but obviously I'm there, but right down here is uh, we, we decided we wanted to, we were going to speak about connectivism and MOOCs. So, uh, and MOOCs, for those of you familiar with MOOCs, they were started by George Siemens and Stephen Downs. So we had Stephen Downs as a guest speaker in our class. Last night, I was in Pierre Lévy, Collective Intelligence. Um, this character here, I, was, I had him in my class last night. This is what the new thing can do. And, and I'm sure Roland talked about the whole problem-based learning approach. I'm not going to go uh, into that yeah. also, but but the we changed. We had to convince a lot of profs. I mean, Roland and I were uh, the, the the 
the initiators, if you want. Um, but we had to convince a lot of profs, and uh, sometimes not always easy, to push them to this idea because it means a radical change in in uh, thinking about pedagogy, and for the students also, it means a radical change because they they, they go into a master's thinking you're going to tell me what to do, and all of a sudden, no, we're not telling them what to do. <laughs> they have to figure it out on their own. And so the, the, this is a huge cultural change in terms of an education culture. The, the big advantage is, I mean, uh, without going into all the details, we don't use just one system. We use a multitude of software. Um, so there's the weekly video conferencing meetings, but the students use blogs, they use Twitter, um, I, I'm sure Roland went through through the, uh, all the kinds of, of things that, that our students used, but the big advantage and the huge difference that we found is that the dropout rate, okay, the dropout rate um, in the program, the master's program over the last five years has been less than 4%. And for a fully online program, let's remember that none of the students ever have to come to campus. There's no in-class meeting. Everything is done online and we have a retention rate of over 95-96%. Uh, for online programs, this is hugely different because most online programs usually have uh, uh, dropout rates that are um, um, that can, can vary from 50% from to, 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 to sometimes 60 or 70%. So having a dropout rate of lower than 4% is exceptional. And Roland just wrote in that in the BA, the retention rates are, are similar uh, because of the way we do it with that constant uh, synchronous kind of meeting. And, and by the way, in, in the master's program, we're running at about 140 students, I believe. And in the uh, B the A program, Roland, I'm sure you can put in a chat box roughly how many students you're running, but the, the dropout rates have been very, very low, which is which is which means that we have the student motivation, and uh, so we've got 400 plus per term, and uh, very high motivation, and in what we've done, we've got anecdotal information only right now, but the sense of isolation is completely gone. The students in, a, in groups do things online that I've only had seen before that happen in class. They will get together, communicate with each other, and um, pull, <coughs> excuse me, and, and they will do some, some very, uh, how can I put this, to be polite to my poor students, which I love dearly, um, they pull some really good stunts on the profs. They've pulled some jokes on me, but that they would organize on their own and then show up in class. For example, I wear turtlenecks always in, in, uh, online. For some reason, it's a habit. And so one day, they all got together and they all showed up on their cameras with black turtlenecks just to get back at the prof kind of thing. This kind of collaboration outside of class online is unheard of. Now, the second thing that um, uh, that I mentioned that, that this all of this has led me to do, and this is something that, that you're also very familiar with, uh, uh, Elena, is the whole um, GTCU model, or, or the General Technology Competency in Use. I will just go through it briefly, but the idea was that um, my interest was, if we're going to do all this online, what do we as professors need as competencies and what do the students need as competencies on the one hand and on the other hand is what will this doing all of this help in terms of what competencies am I likely to develop using all this technology. And although there are many models out there and inventories uh, that, that categorize all these competencies, I wanted to start from something that was not exclusive to education, but I wanted to start from something that was far more general. And that's why I went right back to the um, IEEE definition of technology, that technology can only do three things. And I decided to look at the competencies along those three areas. So the first thing I did was I looked at... Okay, the, co the computer chip can transmit and receive information. We use it to communicate. If we communicate, we also have to, I mean, obviously there's the technical skill. We had some technical issues to, to, to get me in this morning. So we both have to have the skills to be able to overcome those technical issues. But beyond that, there has to be a totally different sense of social awareness. For example, I have to be keenly aware that my, my audio is breaking up, that you're having difficulty hearing me, <laughs> okay? Which is why I supplied you with the text 
so you can follow me. So we need to develop s different social skills online that are totally different than face-to-face -face, in addition to. So those yes, social skills... Yes, you are right about, mm -hmm. about technical skills and technical environment. We feel it very, very strongly right now. <laughs> the lack of our skills and our environment. It, it, that, that, I mean, with the technology, this is going to happen. But you see, this is a, an example of um, also. I mean, we had difficulty this this morning with the, with the technical. It happens sometimes in the courses. But what I have found is, if the prof or the one that is um, leading the situation, if you want, is very confident and does not panic, there's a technical problem. We'll solve it. Okay. If we don't panic, then the students don't panic either. If the prof panics, then the course is a disaster. <laughs> so it, it, it's a matter of, of uh, we need to build this. <laughs> the second one is, is, is uh, the informational. I mean, I talked a lot about a while ago the whole idea of what the computer can do and how that information sits in the cloud and whatnot. But because of that, um, it means that we also have to develop a different sense of how to deal with information. We have to develop a different set of competencies on how do we access information and, and how do we select information. How do we make sure that we get it, we get the information and that it's pre-selected for us. It's no longer about choosing a book. It's about getting a lot of people we can trust, getting the information that they filter to us, assessing it and then refiltering it out. So it, it, it's, it's information in and information out. We now participate in that global uh, information economy, if you want. And this is why, like, yesterday evening, I was talking with uh, Pierre Lévy, who wrote Collective Intelligence. So the, the information sphere, we need to be part of, not just consumers of. The, the third and last um, is, is if we're going to use the technology for computational purposes as, as the tool that I was talking about a while ago, to be able to use it properly, um, whether you're talking about using a spreadsheet to make calculations, a statistical package uh, to do some huge complicated statistics, statistics or, or a, a photo editor to really do some really good photo editing, you need to develop, you need to be very competent in the discipline itself. Uh, a mathematician will make far better use of a spreadsheet than somebody who is math illiterate. But by the same token, if you use the spreadsheet and you learn to use a spreadsheet, you will also learn math. And for a good example of that is, is um, you can, uh, I suggest everybody read Seymour Papert, Mindstorms, that was written back in 1980. Uh, on this one, very simple. Um, it's in education, we have made good use, or we are making good use of the social and informational, um, and we are starting to develop these competencies, but we are not doing very much for the making use of the computational side, and this is where probably the, these devices have the most power, and if there's something we need to do in education, it may be to push in that direction, because this is where that digital layer, if you want, um, is where there will be the most changes. All right, I will skip ahead a little bit. Um, what, what we need um, to, to do, and, and I think that Rollin has, has, um, has talked about that. Yes, the social and informational are what we are currently using in education and making good use of. But we are not competent in education enough yet to use the computational elements. And we need to do something about that. Because we are, if we want to help our learners at every level, we need to concentrate a little more and, and, and add to that uh, epistemological competency, if you want, in the disciplines. It's starting to happen, but we have a long way to go. And when we look ahead, the other major change that we will need to do is to revise and rethink the standard relationship of teacher-student content in education. We've always gone by that 
triangle, we need to completely rethink. There are many models out there, but what we do need to look at very seriously is the idea of the learner-learner uh, relationship, the idea of uh, learners dealing with experts directly, using tools, accessing information in a network. The teacher is no longer the center. The teacher was never the center. The teacher should not be the center. And we have to really consider that whole network as mm -hmm. being the new reality of the classroom. Um, and finally, the, the, the and, and, and this is just basically to introduce, but, but the idea that um, to look at these competencies from that model, we've devised a, a, an instrument, a, a survey instrument, um, and I'm sure that, that uh, Elena and, and Todd will, will, will probably talk about this at, at some other point, but the idea is that we need to recognize what our profile is in terms of where what do we use the technology for and how competent are we with the different aspects and the current instrument without going into the details of, of the graphic that you may not see that well right now um, is the idea that we need to see okay do we use these things only for social purposes uh, communication do we use it for information and do we actually also use it for computational purposes? And which devices do we use? Right now, there's obviously there's computers, there's you know tablets, um, there's the mobile phones. But now we now know what Apple has come out with the watch, and everybody's going to come out with a watch now. Um, so the wearable technology is going to be part of the next wave, if you want. Um, and the Internet of Things. I mean, let's face it, I, 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 I was in, in, in the Dominican Republic for a few weeks. I could control from over there the thermostat in my house. Um, I could control the lights in my house. All these connections, how do we use all of this? And, and we need to understand our own profile and understand our students' profile and see where do we want to go with this. So this instrument is going to help us look at this. The, those concepts of Internet of Things and, and, and the cloud and whatnot are what are now defining, defining that because it's now hitting the broad market, it's now defining how technology is going to be used. Those of us who use this regularly are going to be mastering the technology. We will not be mastered by the technology. So education it will play um, a huge, crucial role at the edge, at that edge, and, and what we need to ask ourselves as educators is, are we ready and are we competent? And, and this is really what, what this instrument and this research that, that, that we're doing is looking at, is uh, to try to see if we can establish what our competency profiles are, what the students' competency profiles are, and then to see where do we need to pay special attention. Okay. More details of this are all available on our website. Thank you. I'm open to questions, please. Thank you so much.